So counterpoint to that, we now have um, two representatives from Quantum Sphere uh, who are going to speak about their experiences with Nano EHS. Again, this is another company that's been very proactive about um, nano safety um, and hence so a model citizen, as it were, um, but can give us a little bit more perspective from the smaller company's perspective. Um, uh, first, we have uh, Kevin Maloney, who's the founder and CEO of Quantum Sphere, and then we have Brendan McKenney, who's the director of operations. Okay, great. Well, thanks for uh, having Brendan McKenney and I here today. My name is Kevin Maloney, founder and CEO of Quantum Sphere. I started this company in 2002, uh, just in a little spot about the size of my brother's garage in uh, Orange County. So you never know what's kind of being built up in the in the garage days. But we're sort of on the other spectrum, just a little bit smaller than BASF with our 15 people, and um, and because there was no real clear guide in 2002 when I started this. Uh, science project, we really worked from a transparency perspective and, a, and that was sort of our philosophy and approach is just be transparent from a regulatory, financial, and quality perspective. So we've always been sort of fully audited from a financial perspective and fully audited uh, with the regulatory agencies and then ISO 9000 compliant as well. But uh, quantum sphere means measured sphere. We literally manufacture uh, metal catalyst particles. We don't do carbon nanotubes. We don't do composites. And we're leveraging the high surface area, the high activity of these catalyst materials. The catalyst creates a faster chemical reaction. And so we're leveraging these high surface area, very small nanoscale particles into multiple different portable power, clean energy applications. Um, we've learned quite a bit about the, the materials and the processes uh, for, for handling. And uh, you know we, we, we've always used sort of industry best practices. And I think it was 2007 when we first started working with uh, Mark Methner at NIOSH. And we've uh, volunteered three years in a row now in a program to provide additional transparency, open up our production facility and laboratory environment to the regulatory agencies. And most recently, Frank Parr from DTSC and uh, Habib from Cal, Cal EPA, Hamid and also DTSC came out and really worked with our team and our facilities to measure the air, measure the, the approach that we were taking to uh, handling uh, these materials. So, um, you know, from, you know, so going back to 2002 and the fact that we're making these small particles, you know, we're in the 5 to 25 nanometer range typically and the materials and products that we're developing are, you know, we're leveraging them to create greater efficiencies. And typically, if you're generating, storing, or using energy, um, you're, coming, you're leveraging or dependent on, or at some point in the life cycle, come across a catalyst. And so we've demonstrated some pretty breakthrough performance in these applications, which, you know, obviously end up being pretty high profile. And, and so, you know, the perspective Brendan and I will bring to you today as a small company is really on the manufacturing of the materials safe handling and limited exposure to the people at our facility. We also engage with our customers and partners on how they integrate our materials into their specific end use applications. But ultimately we're all responsible for safety and, and handling and so we want to get that right. Uh, so we're really happy that we've been able to form some key partnerships with some of the regulators uh, represented here today. Um, but whether you're leveraging our materials in a, in a dispersion and aqueous solution that goes inside of a um, a battery or the wash coat for the, for the catalytic converter or a coating of the iron catalyst used for ammonia production in the chemical industry, a $100 billion market, we can provide additional surface area. So we're pretty committed to driving value from an energy efficiency or power storage perspective. And because these are high profile applications, we want to get that right. This is our facility in Southern California, just an hour south of here. This is part of our production facility. We've got eight different reactors. 
capable of producing about 500 um, kilograms a day, I mean, excuse me, a month of material. And again, we don't do carbon nanotubes. These are all metal catalysts with a solid metal core and an oxide shell or, core or coating that we control around the, uh, around the particles. Um, and so how does it work? We are working in a closed loop vacuum system, which we think is important. It helps uh, eliminate exposure to, to the, uh, to the empl employees in our facility. And so we are literally using a lot of electricity. We're using helium as a quenching gas. We, we take the micron sized particles or a wire form larger uh, metal uh, raw feed and we'll feed it into our vacuum system. We'll melt it down and liquefy the metal as it condenses and vaporizes in its molten state. We'll simply uh, quench it with a helium gas with an excellent cooling agent and we'll harden those particles up the size we desire. So we truly con control with a very narrow distribution and, and excellent uniformity the particle size. And because of that high surface area, that metal core combination and oxide shell uh, thickness that we control, we're getting some really good performance. We don't convert the whole periodic table. We're focused mostly on the, uh, the elements highlighted in green. A good portion of those in the red box are catalytic and they used, you know, catalysts are using 80% of the products produced in, in the world. So catalysts are pretty important and getting this right to us as a small company is also important. Um, and we're also ISO 9000 compliant, which is really key from a manufacturing perspective. We can, you know, we put the quality management systems in place. So you know, we continue to operate in a very uh, transparent perspective. And as the founder and, and CEO, I'm obviously not an expert and we don't um, claim to be experts in this area, but which is why we went out and sort of worked with the regulators and said, come on in come on into our facility, work with our team. We're pretty transparent about our strengths and weaknesses. We're more concerned about overcoming some challenges that we have as they relate to our weaknesses. And we want to get this right. And why do we want to get it right? Well, from our perspective, you know, there's some key ingredients that have to be in place to really protect and, and, and build enterprise value as it relates from an EH&S perspective. And it doesn't just start from, you know, the, the board or the CEO. It really, you know, governance really applies to, you know, the leader in the organization is also responsible for EH&S. And our director of operations, Brendan McKenney, takes that very seriously. So we want to be clear that this function cuts across all lines, up and down, and across the organization. Uh, we have it a little bit easier than, than what uh, Raymond talked about with BASF because we are a smaller company and so we don't have to go to different business units and so we make it happen from the top down but everybody uh, is involved through, throughout the business. Um, from a compliance standpoint, you know, it's a culture that must be integrated across that that, uh, that organization. And a lot of people say, you know, in an early stage company, why might that matter? Well, because nanomaterials are generally a newer area, we're talking 10 to 20 years old, and a lot more products are being introduced into the market that, are, that depend on or leverage these, these interesting materials with unique physical characteristics, you know, why would you bother in a small company, you either get it right and make a bunch of money or not? Well, we knew it was going to take 8 to 12 years to bring some products to market and to scale and to uh, file some key patents and to work with and engage some really large companies and customers and partners. And we leverage their expansive networks and distribution channels to bring these products to market. So why bother? Well, protecting our brand and their brand is really critical. Getting that reputation, not jeopardizing that reputation is important, especially as a small company. Um, preventing environmental events and disasters, obviously key. We don't want to end up in the news. Uh, eliminating fines and penalties from regulatory agencies. Um, that, that's a huge you know, showstopper for small companies. We want to get that right uh, from the beginning. Uh, and obviously number one is saving lives and preventing injuries of our employees and limiting exposure as well. And then you know, selfishly we always want to of course build a sound you know, corporate and, and responsible image. Um, and so, so that's really key. The third really the key point there is, is really you know, seizing opportunities in new areas. And we're talking about clean and green technologies. It's a kind of a, a real um, area of big interest since, you know, the 2006-2007 time frame. A lot of funding happening in water, solar, lithium batteries, wind, um, biofuel uh, applications, emissions reduction, clean air. And, and so we want to get that right. We, we see this as a marketing opportunity also just to get it right as a small company and to put our seal of approval or stamp of approval, sort of, the, sort of like the ISO 9000 uh, certificate you get 
you know, for, for working with the regulated, regulators and getting it right. Um, and so what did we do from a small company? We really couldn't go online and buy a redacted EHS policy and drop our name into it because we were doing something sort of new and unique and, and this is a patented process that we leveraged this closed loop vacuum system. So we literally had to create our MSDS documents from, from scratch and work with some regulators. We literally worked with half a dozen different universities that, that um, we provided material for for different evaluation and tox toxicity studies. Um, so we went out and put the policies and procedures in place. We, 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 we looked online and worked with some, some agencies about typical EHS training and we had to take that one step further from a, from a compliance perspective when you're dealing with these nanomaterials. So we reached out on a voluntary program to Mark Methanar at NIOSH and, and then Frank Parr came in the door from DTSC and Cal EPA came out and said, you know, we want to work with you guys. We're not perfect. This is what we're doing. We want to make sure we get it right and we can educate each other and, and sort of help, uh, you know, set the precedence in the industry with the large and small companies with a lot of transparency we can provide some value and prevent, you know, some, some unnecessary incidents. And so that's what we've done. It uh, doesn't mean we're doing it any better than anybody else. We're simply opening our doors and saying, here's what we're good at. Here's what we're doing. Help us do it right or better. We think we're using best practices, uh, but we may not be in some areas. And through our, our, um, our work with the regulatory agencies, we realized that there's, there are some things that we could improve upon. And so we immediately um, integrated some of the suggestions into our existing processes and, and adjusted uh, accordingly. Um, and so we really take it seriously to provide training uh, at all levels. Um, you know, we, we also look at uh, management systems that need to be in place. Does Brendan have the tools he needs from a monitoring perspective? Uh, and other EHS tools that we can put in place to make sure that we are we are doing uh, things by the book. Um, and then you know we also look at opportunities where uh, you know where where QSI can play a role in, uh, in better understanding the risk and address the issues and opportunities. And that's where the transparency comes into place by working with the regulators. We've built in our opinion, such a great relationship with the regulators that we think we can go to them now with any issue or problem and say, here's what we're doing. We're, we're, we think there could be an issue. How do we overcome this? How do we resolve it? What can we do to avoid this in the future? And how can we, more importantly, not just propaganda about QSI, but uh, how can we educate others on, on how to adopt these, these processes? And so we've got quite a bit of information on our website. We even have the NIOSH reports. Uh, published on our websites from Mark Methner on what we can do better or different. We just said, you know what, let's put it out there and help even our competitors understand that it's not a scary thing to engage with the regulators. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we did. Um, from, from that perspective, you know, I just wanted to really kick it off and give a few words from, from the top down. And also we looked at some of the trends in the EH&S industry. And you know, compliance is really important in the EHS uh, industry because of uh, these clean and green technologies uh, is becoming a lot more visible. Um, you know, the cost for non-compliance by far outweighs compliance. Uh, not just from a stock price perspective, we're not public, but but that's part of building the enterprise value of just getting it right. But also proactive compliance, and so we've and we will continue to reach out even when we get things wrong, and we do uh, with the regulators. So we're going to continue that relationship. Um, with that, I'm I'm going to hand it over to Brendan McKenney, and he'll really focus on sort of the, um, the, the case study, the actual case study of what we did maybe better or different or not so perfectly and, and our dialogue with the regulatory agencies over the last few years, sort of what we did to put in place uh, to, to limit exposure and, and take it to the next level. And we're just scratching the surface here. We're all learning together, but it's a pretty important thing for us to get right. So thank you again for having us and I'll let Brendan take over from here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, forgive me if I'm a little rough around the edges. I haven't done this since uh, fifth grade book report. So um, similar subject at the time, but uh, all new these days. Anyways, um, we basically have uh, how do I want to get this to work. All right, um, basically have like five cornerstones to our process here at QSI. Um, first and foremost is worker safety. I mean that's uh, there's nothing that comes close to that. Um, we are a small company. Uh, everybody's like a family there, so we uh, we take this very seriously. Um, we've got a number of company values that we um, that we adhere to and we we embrace. 
Um, I'd like to discuss some of the equipment that we've uh, developed and, and we use here daily uh, to keep ourselves uh, safe. Um, discuss my team and the training that we've uh, been involved with and then discuss some of the tools that we've um, embraced and used uh, uh, that are out there for us to use. Um, <coughs> QAnosphere has a, uh, a value um, system in place, but first and foremost is we have a vision of zero. Um, zero incidents, zero exposure um, releases or material releases, zero injuries across the board, whether it's related to our nanomaterials or someone tripping over a ladder. Um, no accidents and uh, zero environmental harm as well. I mean, we want to make sure that uh, a lot of the progress and the, the materials that we make are beneficial for the environment, we think. Um, clean energy, we don't want to, uh, we want to help out, we want to reduce our dependency on, on uh, fossil fuels, things like that, so we want to do our best to protect the environment as well. <clears throat> our whole, um, our value system basically starts uh, at the top. Uh, Kevin Maloney has put a great, uh, great team together and has basically, you know, from the top down shared with us these, uh, these uh, values that we have here. Um, we really want to understand and manage the potential risks that are out there. Um, we don't understand everything. We're new, we're small, we don't have uh, the big budgets for all the R&D work that we would like to have, but um, we, we take it to heart and we, we work really hard to understand these things. Um, and management provides us with the vision and the, and the driving force to be able to get whatever done we need to get done. Whatever materials I need, if budgets are tight, if I say it's for safety, it's done, purchase rec is in and I got it taken care of and that's the way the company has been founded from the, from the beginning. Um, there's nothing more important than that. So, um, and the knowledge that we've, uh, that we obtained has been, been hard fought. Um, we, we've set up a number of different things in place where we have uh, periodic work site analysis, analysis, excuse me, um, to elim eliminate our hazards around the uh, workplace. <clears throat> set up monthly safety meetings where we'll even go through as a team and walk through the production facility and take a look at things, see if we can find any potential hazards out there that need to be eliminated, anything that we can do better. Um, just found something just the other day, uh, something simple, but it was a, a great, quick, easy fix and it made things just that much safer. Um, all of our results are shared via company-wide training. Uh, like I said, we have company monthly safety meetings which incorporates training. Uh, I happen to be in charge of that as well. Um, I just switch hats from time to time. But, um, and then all, these, all this is then shared again with our MSDSs. Once again, Kevin mentioned that we developed our own MSDSs. Um, our team put to, did all the research, put them together, used all the knowledge that are out there and collaborated with many universities to help develop these. Um, they're shared with our company. They're shared with people via our website. They're shared with anybody that comes through there. You should see our MSDS folders. Um, we built a, a custom database to be able to have easy access for everybody company-wide to be able to access and have instant access to, uh, to the, all the safety information. Um, and we've always been very transparent with what we know and what we don't know and made that information available to, um, to even like the, the first responders. We've had our, Santa, our local fire department come through there, show them what we've got, where we have it, where it's stored, where we, how we protect ourselves. Um, they're very comfortable knowing uh, what, what we have there and knowing what we have in place to protect ourselves and, and them if they, if, in case of emergency. So um, once again, uh, transparency has been key for us to be able to get out there and embrace the, the information that other people have um, so we can learn from them as well. Um, when it comes to prevention, um, we basically divine everything we can from, the, from our administrative and engineering controls. Um, Kevin mentioned our closed loop system. I'll get into that a bit more in a minute. But uh, that's been, you know, uh, us as a small company, we've had that benefit to be able to build it from the ground up to make sure that safety was, first off, it wasn't an afterthought. It was always first and foremost in our mind, how can we eliminate any exposure? How can we make sure that this is all taken care of? There's no releases nowhere. Um, Personal protection, personal protection equipment is key. Uh, you can't walk through my production facility without your safety glasses on or I'll chase you right back out again. Um, it's just the way it is. It's, it's in, been ingrained in our, in our system. Uh, luckily enough, we're small enough. We don't have to, you know, chase hundreds or thousands of people around, but it's, uh, it, it's been that way from the beginning. Um, we also have a preventive maintenance system in place. Um, it's also helped us with our ISO qualification or, um, all the preventative maintenance for our machines, for our uh, equipment, everything in there, 
safety is, is first and foremost, and the preventative uh, maintenance systems uh, really help with that. And uh, we also have our emergency preparedness programs, which we also discuss in, in our monthly um, safety meetings, as well as our quarterly management review meetings as well. So all these things are, are uh, discussed. Uh, one of our other values is our sustainability. Um, one of the most main things is uh, we do strive towards a green supply chain. Um, we use uh, ISO supplier questionnaires to be able to work with our partners and suppliers for our raw materials to make sure that they um, have sort of the same uh, you know, values that we do. Um, and one of the main things that we have is uh, our recycling system. Uh, essentially, we've eliminated uh, just about every single bit of waste from our production process by being able to either recycle or rework the material. So our hazardous waste stream is just about nothing. We've been pretty proud to be able to recycle everything. It gets, can get put back into the system. It can be reworked. And as a result, we hardly have any waste. Um, and recycle, recycle, recycle. That's good for everybody. Um, then we, uh, we also have a policy to uh, continuous improvement. I mean, once again, it's, uh, it's part of the basis of our ISO system as well. But uh, we always strive for the stars, just like the little, little guy there. Um, you know, we always want to upgrade our understanding uh, of the impact of these materials on us. We always want to, we're always on the lookout for new information. Happy to take calls from, from anybody. I mean, Mark Mether, Niosh, anybody they got calls, I pick up the phone instantly. We're happy to do that. Um, and we're always, 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 always trying to adapt and make sure that we can maintain and attain our vision of zero. Um, once again, no, no one needs to be exposed to anything, so our, our system has been designed from the ground up. So um, under our equipment, uh, we've developed a patented closed loop manufacturing process. Um, it's basically, uh, as I said, we were able to design it from the ground up uh, with this in mind. Here's, a, here's an image of actually the only time that um, uh, that I'll go back to that for a second. That um, workers are potentially exposed. Uh, our reactor systems, um, from time to time, need to have the heating elements replaced. And during that time, we've been able to uh, enlist the help of some guys to help us develop uh, systems in place to make sure that basically we limit the exposure. Um, our, pro our entire process is under vacuum, um, so with limited interaction required, we've been able to, Kevin mentioned we have eight reactors. One technician can run and manage every one of them. Um, that's how hands-off the system is. We basically add raw material to the top, and we take out the collected nanomaterial at the bottom. It's never, uh, there's been no releases from that. Um, we basically, the material is under a sealed container or under vacuum the entire time. Um, and once again, it's only during reactor maintenance, which is only about a half an hour um, per reactor. Uh, each material is different, but it could be once a week, it could be once a month per reactor. So we, we try to limit the exposure as much as possible. Um, you know, PPE, uh, you know, we have to use it. You got to use it. Uh, you don't see a, a firefighter heading into a fire without his turnouts on and his uh, his mask and rebreather and things like that. And that's the same approach that we've taken uh, at QSI. We um, got to use it. Um, during reactor maintenance, we use a 3M supplied air system um, that goes through a filter and also a CO monitor, things like that, to make sure that we have a positive airflow for the, uh, for the technician when he's uh, actually working on the reactor. Um, anybody else that might be in the vicinity uh, uses a, the, just the N95 particle masks. Um, gloves, of course, um, from time to time, a little bit more maintenance is required, and a full Tyvek jumpsuit is, uh, is utilized, which is lightweight, easy to use, and easy to uh, dispose of in our waste stream, and uh, lab coats at all times when we're in, in, the, in the production facility. Um, the use of HEPA filters has been um, amazing for us. Uh, we had a, a great suggestion to use, um, to use a system to um, help capture the, any materials that are released during our, our maintenance period. Um, and we basically designed a, uh, a flexible uh, vacuum system or HEPA filter system with a custom designed flange that actually works with our reactors, which um, when put in place uh, basically eliminates any possible release at all. Any material 
material um, gets pulled right into that HEPA filter. You think some of these materials would go right through the HEPA filter, but they all get stuck in there. There's nothing. That HEPA filter is so clean on the backside, and even particle counters have shown that it's, uh, it's incredibly effective. So um, even just in general use and cleaning around the facility, our shop backs even have a HEPA filter in there. And once again, particle counters on that show that it's, I mean, air is coming out of there cleaner than the background air. Um, basically, uh, our material is never handled outside of the, it's always in a controlled environment. Um, whether it's in our reactor system before it's collected, from there it gets taken right into glove boxes, controlled environments where we classify the material, where we provide our analytical samples for the, our analytical lab, um, passivation for the material, all, all of our material except for maybe one or two uh, metals are pyrophoric right out of the machine. So we need to passivate that for safe handling in, uh, in a non-inert in, uh, environment. We developed a system for that as well. Um, and weighing and packaging. Uh, once again, basically, um, no pr products are ever handled in air uh, without being in a controlled environment. It's always under argon in a, or even just a containment box if necessary. If it's already air safe, we don't need to worry about it being pyrophoric anymore, but it's in a containment box for packaging and weighing. Um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about our, our people and training. Um, this has been the definition of on-the-job training, essentially. Um, you might recognize a couple guys from the pictures there. Um, but um, we really learned as we went all the way through here. Uh, we haven't been experts, but we have sure opened the doors and asked for the experts' help. So, I mean, when I say on-the-job training, we're, we're getting it every day. Um, all of our processes and policies have been put in place as we went. Um, we got a, a massive... Uh, it comes a compilation of policies uh, for every step along the way, and everybody knows them, and we adhere to them uh, religiously. Um, but one of the things, that, uh, great things about being a small company is that we're really able to quickly adapt uh, when necessary. If we have something that has been presented to us or proposed to us, it's been real easy to go out there. Uh, we had a, one suggestion, and honestly, within two days, we had something fabricated and in place and ready to go uh, instantly. And uh, luckily enough, uh, I'm able to able to get that stuff in place. So we're, we're lucky to be small and nimble that way. Um, and then we've had a great bunch of information from my, all my team members. They all work in different places. I used to be in the explosives industry, so I've got a, a unique perspective on dangerous materials as well. So um, we've all been able to pull all, all of our information, and we've got guys that have written the lab procedures, things like that. So everybody has taken part in it. We've all been able to pull that information and make it um, a real joint effort and a, and a really company-wide company, um, company policy. Um, and so this is some of the tools that we use. And we've had equipment, and this is basically some of the tools. And we've utilized these guys. Um, we've been happy to work with NIOSH. I mean, we, we called them up and said, you know, we heard you guys have this system in place. Let's, uh, let's come on out. And, We've, uh, I think Mark has been out there three, maybe four times now, um, and really happy to get all the information as possible from these guys. Um, amazing team. Um, and with their help, uh, even the last report that just came out uh, just last, uh, in the last year, I believe, um, it shows that our policies and procedures are effective and our equipment is, is, is effective. And, um, and once again, we're constantly striving to, uh, to make that even better. Um, once again, fantastic team, I would recommend anybody to take advantage of that, uh, that service and, and really get your, get your hands on, on those guys and some help from them. Um, also OSHA, we called them in as well. Hey, volunteer, come on in, take a look, let us know what we need, all the way from machine guarding to um, you name it, uh, ladders, whatever it may be, we want to make sure that we're safe across the board, whether it's in regards to our, our product specifically or just uh, a safe work environment um, and best practices for manufacturing facilities. Um, and once again, and now the California DTSC, uh, happy to able have them come out at the same time as, as NIOSH were there. I was, uh, I was quite outnumbered there um, for a couple of days. But um, it was a great experience. And um, once again, these guys are, are, are great, to, um, great to work with. We've uh, also helped um, develop the questionnaire for the nano call-in. I know we'll be receiving that questionnaire somewhere soon here for all the, the nano metals that are going to be coming up. And uh, I look forward to seeing that. But um, once again, great guys to work with. Um, happy to happy to be involved with them, and you know, happy to get their assistance. Um, that's it. Be safe. That's the most important thing. Without all else fails. Um, and thank you for your time.
uh, could uh, robotics be used in the manufacturing in the difficult uh, the most hazardous part of the world using robotics in a closed environment rather than being exposed to it and uh, not getting the most efficient results? Uh, you, I suppose that could be uh, in the future. Um, it's a pretty manual process. Uh, it, it, you really need to get in there and um, it's pretty hands-on, so I suppose it could be, but uh, with limited budgets in place, that would have to be something that would be explored somewhere further down the road. A question from the web, um, how do you wash or clean work clothes? Um, we basically use uh, the disposables, uh, so like the Tyvek suits, things like that, and the gloves, so they get disposed of in our, in our waste stream. Um, we have an industrial washer for lab coats that we take care of, um, but for the most part, if uh, once again, there's only a certain time that uh, the materials are even exposed to us, and it's very short amount of time, one person actually does it, so the disposable uh, lab, or excuse me, the suits are, are basically our approach to that. I think that was a really interesting presentation. I was kind of curious, so how do you manage the waste streams like the, the filter material from the HEPA vac, the, uh, the wastewater from the industrial washing, the emissions from the glove boxes, so on and so forth, what's that, and how did you figure those things out? Um, it's a good question. Um, as far as like the HEPA system, our, our vacuums and stuff like that, we have uh, a large enough containment box essentially that we can actually even put our filter system in to be able to remove the HEPA filters, replace the new ones, we can seal them up inside there, and then we have, um, we use a, a, a commercial uh, hazardous materials company to, to help dispose of our waste. Um, most of the materials, any of the material that we can't recycle, which even some of the stuff out of the HEPA filters can be recycled as well, um, is, uh, oxide uh, and has even in some cases, uh, as I mentioned, all the materials are pyrophoric. So as we separate the reactor and actually have to clean things out, uh, a lot of times there's a, uh, the material gets thoroughly burned. So, and then it's not really, I mean, it's massive agglomerates at that point in time. So um, that gets, uh, uh, we worked with our, um, our company that we use for the disposal and got their opinion on things and they classify it as its sort of micron size counterpart at that point. Um, the, you know, the, I don't know what to say about the lab coats and industrial washer. I mean, we don't really, it's just general dirt, I suppose, on there at that point. I mean, because we, we don't handle any of the materials uh, outside, of the, outside of the air. Um, and I don't know if there was another part of the question. I sort of glazed over there. <laughs> All right.